Today on Israel Hayom Insider, we speak with columnist Annika Hernroth Rothstein about her recent trip to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Annika, how are you? I'm great, thank well, you. Welcome back. Thank you, it's great to be back. Uh, Iran, <laughs> what the heck? What were you thinking? I wasn't, uh, and then I went back and I wasn't again, uh, but I'm, I'm very, very glad I went. Okay, it was well, on a whim. It, on a whim? Uh, it, slightly. I was actually at a Rosh Hashanah dinner uh, in Nazion with some friends of mine. In Jerusalem? In Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And uh, the husband of the family mm -hmm. uh, started talking about his family that were left in Iran. Uh -huh. And I thought, huh, Jews in Iran. Yeah. I, I, I rarely think about them outside of like a Purim context. How, how, how many Jews are in Iran? Uh, 12,000 is the official okay. number for whatever that is worth. Okay. Um, and I thought, I should go to Iran and meet hmm. the Jews. I wonder if that's possible, and I started a process yeah. uh, to do that. It took several months, mm -hmm. and it didn't really hit me until I had the visa, because everyone told me, you won't get the visa, Yeah, uh, for obvious reasons, but I did. Well, they must have known you were Jewish, right? Yes. And they must have known that you write for Israeli papers. They do. I mean, I was careful. You know how you can omit things, but not lie? Mm -hmm. So that was the process. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was the, the technique I used. So they ask you, what countries have you written for? Uh, not specific papers, but mm -hmm. different countries you have visited. And mm -hmm. I listed all the countries. Yeah. And rather than put Israel on number one, I, I you know, slid it in there on number seven. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I was hoping for the best. Uh -huh. And it went very well. And they, they knew I was, because I went the first time to meet Jews. So okay. they knew that I was Jewish. And they knew that I was interested in the Jews. And they were very, very happy to show, you know, their minority uh -huh. uh, the protected minority. Yes, exactly. Okay, so you went to Tehran to visit Jews or to other places also? I went to Tehran, I went to Hamadan to see the tombs of Esther and Mordecai, and then mm -hmm. I went to Esfahan. Okay. Uh, but I spent uh, the bulk of the time in Tehran. Mm. That also has 7,000, the biggest population of Jews, 7,000. Okay, what is the condition of the Jewish community in Iran? Do they look like they're suffering economically, politically? Could they speak freely to you? Uh, so it depends on what you mean by condition. I mean, mm -hmm. they're not starving. Yeah. They are not persecuted. They're not but, persecuted. But they are also not free. Okay. So <laughs> they're, they're not free like everyone else is not free? Yes, but also it's a freedom with conditions. Because yes, mm -hmm. they are a protected minority, but mm -hmm. everyone kept telling me that they live within a framework. Mm -hmm. And you have to be very mindful of that framework is Sharia law. Which mm -hmm. means that that is, you know, everything is, is connected to Islamic law. Okay. You are in the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to relate to that. So um, they can practice Judaism, yes. right? Openly, freely? Very openly, very freely. I Do mean, they feel safe? It depends because, you know, I was always in the company of government personnel. Mm -hmm. So Who's when sort I. Sort of an undercover agent? Who is, Probably. you know, a, a translator. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, you know, do with that what you will. Uh -huh. But there were always people who worked for the foreign ministry with me. Mm -hmm. At Shabbat dinner, mm -hmm. I sat next to uh, a young Muslim man okay. who was my translator. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, a very odd situation to make Kiddush yeah. in front of a Muslim man in the Islamic Republic mm. of Iran. So, you know, the, the host said, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry if I offend you. I'm sorry if I offend you. And the man <laughs> said, no, that's fine. But you see that framework that... Yes, they're free to practice their religion. Mm -hmm. More free in a certain sense that I am where I come in from. In Sweden, because there are several kosher, kosher butcheries in Tehran. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, I went to several kosher restaurants. And, wait, and in Sweden, there's no kosher butcher? No, there's no kosher it's, slaughter since 1937. It, it's outlawed. It's illegal. Okay. Right. Okay. And people walk outside with kippot, and you see, you know, uh -huh. kids playing. Things that you wouldn't do in, in Europe. No, of course. Mm. Not anymore. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and I could go out and have kosher food, which I can't. So okay. it, what about the population uh, in general? Do you get the feeling, did you feel, feel the effects of the economic sanctions that have been put on Iran for... Who knows how long? Yeah, and people are speaking about it quite openly. They're very excited about the possibility of a boost in economy. And you mm -hmm. see the same, because everything is off-brand. And everything I saw, you know, cars catch on fire because of uh, the tires they have to use because of really? the sanctions. So they have, uh, you know, Chinese tires mm -hmm. that are, of, you know, lesser quality. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so people were not at all surprised when cars started, you know. Okay burning in the middle of the street because mm -hmm. this is something that happens mm -hmm. because they have everything is off-brand they've been disconnected from the world for from certain parts of the world um, but they, they also have created a world within that uh, I didn't see 
suffering and poverty, but then yeah. again, there were so many things that I did not see. It's not North Korea by any means, yeah. but it's a very, very controlled picture yeah. that is presented to anyone who comes there because I wasn't walking alone. I yeah. wasn't walking around talking to people freely in the street. Okay. I wasn't able to pick up my camera no? and take pictures freely on the street. Okay, you took, uh, you took a lot of pictures, though. I took a lot of pictures, but I ask. Uh -huh, you know, okay. I ask, is this all right? Can I uh -huh. speak to this person? Uh -huh. um, I was not allowed to be close to large groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then again, large groups of people were not really possible close to the election because they were... Yes, you were there, you know, it you was were there the second time for the election. Yes. Okay, tell us about that. Um, first of all, what happened during the election? And, uh, and what was it like to be there? Well, it was, it was interesting. The thing leading up to it was also interesting because I, I, I was very excited to go once, you know, because mm -hmm. I never thought I would ever go to Iran. Mm -hmm. And then on the last day, they said, yeah, we would like to offer you to come back. We would like to issue you a visa now to uh -huh. come back and cover the elections. Really? Okay. And of course, I knew that these, there were strings attached, as mm -hmm. there always is. And I thought, but I can't miss this opportunity. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't, it's an historic election in a way, okay. because the Supreme Leader is so old. And the election is for um, the parliament and the assembly of experts that will, at some point, elect a new supreme a leader. A new supreme leader. Only when this one goes. When, when this, one, this one goes. And mm -hmm. he's now, at this point, 76 years old. Mm -hmm. He's in very bad health. No one knows exactly how bad. Okay. Uh, but I saw him in person. Um, really? Yes. Tell us about that. <laughs> I was invited to go to the supreme leader's house uh -huh. um, on election day that morning to watch him cast the first vote in the Iranian elections. And of course, who says no to that? <laughs> So I, I, I went to his house. <laughs> <laughs> That's for, like their version of the White House? Y yes. I mean, not as accessible, I would uh -huh. say. Um, so they let it be known that this was a very elite group of okay. 20 people that were allowed to go. 20 foreign journalists? Yes. And then some Iranian journalists from press TV and, you mm -hmm. know, their, their outlets. Yes. Um, and then, of course, it was clergy surrounding, surrounding him mm. uh, were in awe of this tiny man <laughs> who walked out <laughs> really? and, you know, shook everyone's hand and then put the ballot in and, mm -hmm. and left. And what I could see, he's old, he's decrepit, he's, you know, he won't see the next election, which was why mm. this was an important one. Okay. And we hear in the West that the reformists made major gains. Uh, it was a big victory for them. Right. Um, is, would you confirm that? Is that something that you, that, uh, is it meaningful, first of all, the difference between the hardliners and the reformists? No. I, I mean, the, the simple answer is no, mm. uh, because you have a system, in the, the long and the short of it is that uh, the supreme leader is a placeholder for their messiah, the okay. 12th imam, mm -hmm. <laughs> who they're, you know, expecting to come any day now. Right. And he is there to take care of, of the nation mm -hmm. until the Messiah arrives. And all, every ounce of power comes from the Supreme Leader. Mm -hmm. And he picks um, the clergyman, who then uh, picks the assembly of experts, who okay. then picks the, the candidate. Supreme Leader. So, I mean, yeah. it's a very close circuit. So does it matter? Is, is there a difference? Perhaps if there is a slightly more moderate Mm -hmm. Supreme Leader, at some point there will be fewer executions. Mm. Maybe, I mean, but it's, it's degrees in hell, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not a major radical difference. And when we say reform and yeah. when we say conservative, yeah. it doesn't really apply to an Iranian context. Mm -hmm. And I would also, I mean, I thought before that there would at some point be another revolution. Before I went, I thought, this is a people who yearns for the West. Yeah. And who is that the feeling you got that they yearn to to be accepted by the West or to become part of the I, rest of the world? I thought this before I went, mm -hmm. and I completely changed my mind. Really, um, my view is that this is a an extremely proud nation, mm -hmm. extremely nationalistic, mm -hmm. who wants more freedom within their context. Okay, but on their terms. On their terms, after uh, two th two thousand and nine, mm -hmm. there is no. The, the fire, the, the, the government put out that fire yeah. within the people in a very, very effective way. Mm. And what they're looking for now, in my opinion, through the deal, is um, a better economic... Through the nuclear deal. Yes. Mm -hmm. Better economic circumstances mm -hmm. for them to live in Iran on Iranian terms. Do they, do they have the feeling that so many people in the West have that they sort of won the negotiations, that they got everything they wanted? Oh, yes. Very, very much so. And I was told to my face that this mm -hmm. was the case. I, I interviewed one of the top candidates 
uh, for the conservative list for the for the parliamentary parliamentary elections. And I asked him. I said, "It's my opinion and the opinion of many in the West that you got exactly what you wanted. That mm. Obama, you know, gave away okay. these negotiations." And he smiled at me and he said, "Yes." Really? This is true. <laughs> I agree. And they are very, very proud wow. of how they, 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 what they came away with. And what they came away with was everything. Interesting. Um, and they want, and I was told several times, that de they do not want the Western disease. They look at the West. The Western disease meaning the meaning hedonism the, that they And the as downfall they might see. of the nuclear family. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. gay marriage, divorce, mm -hmm. women who are scantily clad, mixed dancing, right, what do I that, know? But, you know, mm -hmm. th th these things that they see as the downfall of society, and mm -hmm. to a certain extent, as a, as a conservative person and as a religious person, it's not as if I did not see an inkling of a point that mm -hmm. they have, okay. that, that democracy is a very difficult thing. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing, but it's a difficult thing because it means that you have to deal with things that you do not like. Which they're not interested in. They're not interested in that. So that what do they call what they have democracy? Yeah, I mean, people said that to me. But again, mm -hmm. I was there as a foreign journalist yeah. uh, close to the election. So what I was told is not necessarily what people would tell each other in the right. context of their own home. Right. right, right. So of course they call that democracy, and they're very proud. And I got a text from Rouhani. I got um, a, right. an Iranian SIM card, <laughs> and for some reason Rouhani had my number. <laughs> so you know, you get a, a text on Friday morning, uh -huh. the day of the election. He says, you know, our proud democracy, and let's show the West by mm. voting and showing what a strong democracy we are. Mm. In uh, English? In, no, no, no. In Farsi. Okay, okay. In Farsi. But so of course they call it a democracy. Mm. But as everything else, it has conditions. Like the Jewish population has free freedom with conditions. Yeah. And Iran is a country that is filled with conditions and beautiful contradictions, I would say. What was the thing that surprised you the most about your trip? How much I love the country. Really? Because um, I've, uh, aside from Israel, I've mm -hmm. never fallen that deeply in love with the country. Wow. Before. With the people, the views, I mean, obviously not the political system. No, but the, the, the people, the mentality, the mm -hmm. Persian and the Jewish mentality mm -hmm. is quite a lie. I mean, we're very academic, very family-oriented, yeah. uh, warm, mm -hmm. respectful mm -hmm. people, both of us. And I felt a strong connection to the people. Wow. And, and it's beautiful. I mm -hmm. mean, we, my, my ties are there as well. Mm -hmm. And they, if nothing else, they have a deep respect for religion in that country. They do, yeah. <laughs> so as a religious Jew from Europe, it was a fascinating thing. It was a real dichotomy. That's uh, interesting. You know, I, because the, the, um, the Babylonian exile mm -hmm. was really under a per Persian rule. Right. I mean, it was uh, it was so Judaism as we know it today is very affected by the by the Persian culture of way back when. Of course, yeah. and it, it was a deeply moving thing to for me to, for example, be able to go to visit the tombs of Esther and Mordecai. Yeah, that I didn't even know the rumors were that they had been destroyed and would, what would they look like, mm. and to to walk down the street in Hamadan and, and ask for it by name and have. All these Muslims say, oh, yeah, it's over there. Uh -huh. I'm so happy that you come to visit it. Wow. And it's in this beautiful condition. And to be able to stand there and, mm. and really feel history mm. um, and feel connected that way as a Jew is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And if nothing else, I learned that when you travel as a Jew, it's, it's weirdly the same wherever you go. Wherever you mm -hmm. walk into a shul in whatever country, even in Iran, Yafe. you feel connected. Nice. Okay, Annika, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, are you going back? Oh, uh, if I can at some point, maybe I will, um, if they'll have me, which I am not sure they will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you got to write a book. Okay, I will. When, when you do, we will uh, publicize it. We'd be happy to. Excellent. And uh, I want to thank the viewers for uh, watching us, for continuing to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and we'll see you next time.